day after day after day, Lord, week after week after week, month after month, year after year, Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your presence that protects us. We thank you for your presence that gives us wisdom. We thank you for your presence that pulls us away from sin. We thank you for your presence that empowers us. We thank you for your presence that encourages us, oh God. Holy Spirit of God, we say thank you. You are welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Take absolute control, Holy Spirit of God. Demolish every activity of the evil one, Holy Spirit of God. Let your presence overshadow us. Let your presence overwhelm us. Holy Spirit, we say thank you. Father, you are worthy. And so, Lord, I testify that Jesus heals and Jesus saves. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your presence with us. Lord, you've given me a word to share with your children, Lord. I cannot do this without your empowering presence, Holy Spirit. And so move as only you can and let your way come forth with power and authority and signs and wonders to transform the lives of your children, Lord Jesus. To break bondages, Lord. To heal, Lord God. Let your presence overshadow us, Spirit of the living God. Lord, in Mark 7 and 37, as you were ministering, Lord, the crowd looked and the Bible says they were in amazement. And they said, he does all things well. He even causes the mute to speak and the deaf to hear. You do all things well. You haven't changed. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so do all things well for your children today. To you be every praise, every honor, every glory, every adoration. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. We love you, Holy Spirit. Can we put our hands together for the King of Kings? Amen. He's worthy of praise. Amen. Let's thank the Lord with a wonderful clap offering. He's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated, please. We, we are continuing our series uh, on the Holy Spirit. And this is the sixth uh, sermon in the spirit in the in the uh, series. Our message uh, last week, or well, the last message, was the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that was part two, and today we're going to go into part three uh, of that message, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. Our text is Ephesians five and eighteen. The Bible reads, "Don't be drunk with wine." Because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And so, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And we mentioned in the previous sermon that when a person is uh, filled with wine, his whole being comes under the influence of the alcohol and there are resultant uh, effects on the person. And similarly, when, when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, there are visible results that can be seen in the life of that individual. And we've already looked at six activities of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Uh, we've looked at the work of transformation. We've looked at empowerment. We've looked at character development. We, we've looked at guidance. Uh, we've looked at the teaching work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. We also looked at the fact that the Holy Spirit brings life into our situations. And I want us to conclude that uh, with two more activities of the Holy Spirit. Number one, the fact that the Holy Spirit draws, away, draws us away uh, from sin. And then secondly, we'll also look at the work of intercession of the Holy Spirit, which is the fact that the Holy Spirit prays for us. Now, again, uh, it is very, very important for us to understand that the Holy Spirit should be foundational to everything we do as Christians. That, that's the way God, God, God has designed our work. That the Holy Spirit will be foundational to everything that we do uh, you know, as Christians. Now, I want you to just imagine uh, if, if every one of us, as children of God, truly allow the Holy Spirit to be foundational to everything that we do. So that the Holy Spirit has room to transform us. The Holy Spirit has room to empower us. The Holy Spirit has room to teach us and to guide us every single day. I mean, just imagine how your life would be like 
if you truly allow the Holy Spirit to be foundational to everything you do as a child of God. Now the Bible tells us in Zechariah 4 and 6, the Bible says it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So these are the words of God himself. And, and these words underscore the fact that as children of God, we need the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. And so the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, he says in verse 4, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. I didn't come with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the first part. I came with a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit so that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on the power of God, on the Spirit's power, on God's power. And so Paul is saying that the, the answer to our problems can never be found in the words of any human being, not even the Apostle Paul himself. You, you can't find the answers to the problems you face in life in the words of any human being. Not even the anointed Apostle Paul himself. It can only be found in the word of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, who is a source of God's power. Now, the preacher is only effective when the Spirit of God anoints the preacher to bring forth the word of God. Without the Holy Spirit, all we have is just our human flesh. And the Bible says that the arm of flesh will fail us. And that is why Jesus instructed the, the disciples. He said, I don't want you to, to leave Jerusalem. I want you to stay in Jerusalem until you have been anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. It is, it is imperative, church, that we know, that we understand, and that we crave for the fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit continually. It should be a daily craving that, that we have. And hopefully these series of sermons are opening our eyes and our hearts and understanding to the fact that we need the Holy Spirit in a very, very practical way. I, I was thinking about this and I said to myself, you know, you know, elections are coming all over the world and, you know, countries are looking for, for people who will lead them and guide them and it's almost like everybody is looking for, for a superman. You see, the world doesn't need supermen. What the world needs are supernatural men. Are you with me? The world doesn't need supermen. What the world needs are supernatural men because when people are supernatural because their lives are truly connected to God, it makes a world of difference. Politicians who are filled with the spirit of God and are genuinely desiring to please God will do what is right for the nation. Doctors who are filled with the Spirit of God and, and really want to do what is right will do what is right for, for society, for their patients. Mothers who are filled with the Spirit of God and want to do what is right will, will mother their families well, same as fathers. I mean, think about it. And so the world doesn't really need uh, supermen. We, 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 we need supernatural men, people who are filled with the Spirit of God, pastors who are filled with the Spirit of God and the fear of God will lead the children of God right. That's the importance of, of the Holy Spirit and Him connecting us with God and the Word of God in a way that will make a difference in society. Amen? And so that's what we need. And that's why it's so important for us to be filled continually with the Spirit of God. Let, let's go ahead and conclude with two more activities of the Holy Spirit. Activity number seven is that the Spirit of God draws us away from sin. Now, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit and, and you live under his influence, he will help you to control your natural cravings. That's what the Spirit of God will do. He will help you to control your natural cravings. And so, the, the, Apostle, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 27, he says, I beat my body and make it my slave. I mean, think about it. I beat my body and make it my slave. In other words, I do not allow my body to be, you know, to be controlled by my natural cravings. I allow myself to be filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit within me so that my body will be brought under control. Now, some time ago, there was a commercial on TV, and I, you know, I haven't seen it lately. I'm not sure uh, if some of you will recall, but 
it, it was about, about a woman who was helplessly drawn by her bladder to visit the bathroom continually. And so, you know, you know those little uh, figurines that you have beside the person in the commercial, and so it's like whenever that thing drew, drew the woman, the woman would rush to the bathroom because she just had to go to the bathroom. She didn't control her, her bladder. But then she went on and then they advertised a medication. She took the medication and suddenly she was in control of her bladder. And she wasn't running back and forth uh, to, to, to the bathroom. And I thought about that. And I said to myself, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does for us. The Holy Spirit helps us to control our flesh. Now, remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will receive power when the Spirit of God comes upon you. And that power includes the ability for you and I to say no to sin. The power of the Holy Spirit includes the ability for you and I to say no to sin. Whatever your struggle might be, tell yourself every day, I will submit to the Spirit of God who lives in me. He's my paraclete. He's the one who has been called alongside me, the gift of the Father, to help me live successfully and victoriously every day. So I'm going to submit to the Spirit of God. My tongue will, will, will build rather than tear down. My, my eyes will not see and view pornography. My, my heart will be filled with worship. My heart will be filled with gratitude rather than anger and bitterness and, and unforgiveness and, and lust. My, my heart will rejoice with others rather than envy the blessings that God has given to others. I, I will not be filled with jealousy. I will not be filled with greed. I, I will not be filled with dishonesty because I'm depending upon the Spirit of God to help me to avoid all these sins. I will present myself as a living sacrifice to the living God who dwells in me. So remember what the Bible says. The Bible says that you as a child of God can declare a thing and that declaration will be established. And so make that declaration every single day. Every single day. Every single day, make that declaration and ask the Holy Spirit to help you and he will help you. Engage the Holy Spirit every single day in your life because he's a gift of the Father to help us to live a victorious Christian life every single day. You see, as believers, hear me carefully. As believers, we face a daily battle between the spirit and the flesh. It's a daily battle. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 7. And he says in verse 24, let me read a few verses from there. The, the, the Apostle says, but I need something more. I need something more than what I have. For I know the law, but still can keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can wear it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions such as they are don't result in actions, they don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good sin, it's right there to trip me up. I truly decide in God's commands, but it's obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel. And just when I least expect it, they, they take advantage. They take charge. In other words, my tongue is not cooperating. I don't say the things I'm saying, but I just find that my tongue is not cooperating. I don't want to go to this place, but somehow I find myself there. That's a struggle. I've tried everything and nothing else. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that a real question? Can you see the struggle, church? In fact, the NIV renders uh, verse 24 this way. What a wretched man I am. Who can rescue me from this body of death? I'm struggling. I'm a wretched man. Who, who, can, who can rescue me? And so, question, 
uh, how do we win this conflict between the spirit and the flesh? And the answer is the Holy Spirit of God. And that is why the Holy Spirit of God is so important to the life of a Christian. Listen to uh, what the Bible says in Galatians 5. Listen to verse 16 uh, and read a few verses from there from the New Living Translation. The Bible says, so I say, let the Spirit guide your lives. Let the Spirit of God guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. And so there's a battle that is going on. And verse 19 says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lots of pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, calling, uh, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and sins like these. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. He produces joy, he produces love, patience, peace, he produces kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And verse 24 says, those who belong to Jesus Christ have nailed the desires and passions of their sinful nature to his cross and and crucify them there. And since we, we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Now, let me just break this down. As long as you live on the face of this earth, as long as you live in this body called the flesh, you always face temptations of the flesh. And so you'll be tempted by sexual immorality. You're going to be tempted by impurity. You're going to be tempted by hatred. You're going to be tempted uh, by greed, by jealousy, by, by fits of rage. You're going to be tempted by selfishness and, and envy. You face these temptations and many more temptations. But when you allow the Spirit of God to lead you, he, he will give you the strength to pull away from all these things, and then he'll pull you towards the things that, that bring pleasure to the heart of God, heart of God and, and that causes your life to be at peace and victorious. Things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and, and faithfulness and gentleness and, and self-control. Now, I see these things, and you know, the Bible calls them the fruit of the Spirit, but as I read through the list, I realized that these are actually powerful weapons. They are powerful weapons for, for, for life uh, and victorious living as a Christian. So, so look at patience. Patience is a powerful weapon. When you are provoked, when the Spirit of God is in you and the fruit of the Spirit of patience is in you, you realize that you have power over that situation and so you won't give in to that provocation which will result in all kinds of things. I mean, think about it. When you have self-control, when you are tempted to do something that is contrary to what God wants for your life, because it's a powerful weapon that you have in your hand, the Spirit of God will enable you to use that, that fruit, the Bible calls it fruit, fruit of self-control, which I see as a powerful weapon to overcome whatever the enemy is trying to, to get you into. These are weapons of the Spirit. Now, when Paul cried out, cried out oh, what, what a wretched man I am, who can rescue me from, from this body of death, that was not the end of the story. Paul went on to say, but thanks be to God, God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we have victory over sin because of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God living within us, the power of the Holy Spirit. Now when you are led by the Spirit, you overcome the temptations of the flesh. Now the reason why Jesus was able to overcome the temptation of, of the devil. Remember the Bible says that Jesus was point, uh, tempted in all points like you and I, but he didn't sin. The reason why he was able to overcome all the temptations of the evil one was because he was filled by the Spirit. In fact, when you read the account of the temptation, the Bible says that Jesus was led by the Spirit to be tempted 
by the devil. So as long as you live in this body, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll sin from time to time. Our ways will be sinful at times. Our thoughts will be sinful at times. And, and our deeds or our actions and will periodically be sinful. In fact, the Bible says, in First John 1, 8, the Bible says, if we claim to be without sin, then we, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we claim to be with us and then we, we receive ourselves. We are living in deception and the truth is not in us. But then if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, so you know, graciously God has made provision for our cleansing. You see, but as Christians, sin should never be a lifestyle. The Bible says in 1 John 3 and 9, the Bible says no one who is born of God will continue to sin. And that's important. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. Ladies and gentlemen, these are days when, when pastors are afraid to, to even mention the issue of sin in church because they, they don't want to offend people for fear that people will just leave the church. But, but that, that, is, that, is, that is so wrong, you see, because we, we ignore God's word to the detriment of the very people that God has called us to help. Listen, living continually in sin is unchristian. Can I have a witness? Living continually in sin is unchristian. God is ready to, to cleanse us and, and, and to forgive us when we confess our sins. But even more exciting is the fact that the Holy Spirit is ready to, to, to empower us as children of God so that we will not live in bondage to sin. And that's the difference. We won't live in bondage uh, to sin. May the power of God, may the spirit of God break every form of bondage and sin in our lives. Amen? May, may we continually walk in the spirit so that we will not fulfill the cravings of the flesh. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. If you believe it, put your hands together for the King. Amen? The enemy can never get you know, the, the, the better part of us. Activity number eight. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He prays for us. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans 8 and 26. The Bible says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. And I'll come back to that word help in a few minutes. The Spirit helps us, and then also weaknesses. The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that cannot be expressed in words. Wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the sins in accordance with the will of God. He prays for the sins. The Spirit of God prays for you, he prays for me, in accordance with the will of God for your life. And this is one of the most amazing ways of, of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He, he's our counselor. He's our advocate. You know, he, he's our comforter. But he also intercedes for us. He prays for us. You know, sometimes we, we are confused and we are uncertain as to how we, we should even pray. Lord, shall I take this job or shall I stay in this, in this uh, you know, current job or shall I take this new job? Lord, shall I break up this, this relationship? What, what, what are you saying to me, Lord? What, what, what's your view on this? Lord, is, is this the right man for me or is this the right woman for me to, to marry? Lord, is this where you really want me to live so I can maximize my potential as your child? Lord, is this the right doctor to continue seeing? Lord, shall I even take this treatment that this doctor is, is, is offering me? Lord, is this the best career path for me? Lord, shall I confront this person about this situation, but, or should, should I just leave it alone? Lord, is this the best way to, to handle this situation? Lord, 
I'm confused. What is the best option for me to take? You see, when you are too weak or, or, or too discouraged to pray, when you feel like you don't even have any more to, to, to you know, more ways to, to offer to God, God in prayer, when you feel as if the only prayers that you can pray are, are your tears. Can I have a witness? You feel like, Lord, all I can do is just cry. I don't even know what to say, Lord. When the circumstances are weighing you down and all you can do is just lie on your bed hours at night and and all you can do is sigh and uh, and you can't even pray, you can't say anything, you're just on your bed. You're just sighing through through the hours uh, of the night. When your mind is riddled with, with questions and there seem to be no answers on the horizon. But when I'm not sure even how to intercede for others, Lord, I want to pray for him, I want to pray for him, but I don't even know how I should go about this. That is when the Holy Spirit of God prays for us in accordance with the will of God. Now, it's important to remember that the prayers that are sure to be answered by God are the prayers that are offered in accordance with the will of God. I win. When we pray in accordance with the will of God for our lives, those prayers will definitely be answered. Why do I say that? Listen to what the Bible says in 1 John 5. Look at 14 and 15 with me. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. In other words, every prayer that is in accordance with the will of God will definitely be answered by God. And that is why the intercessory work of the Holy Spirit is so critical to the life of a Christian because the Holy Spirit of God is the only one who knows the will of God and who therefore can pray for us in accordance with the will of God for our lives. Now, the Bible uh, says the Spirit of God helps us in our weaknesses. That's what we just read. He helps us in our weaknesses. Weaknesses refer to the limitations of our human condition. That's what the Bible describes as, as, as a weakness. You and I are limited. So, so we are limited in what we know. Our knowledge of God's will far sh- falls far short of, of perfection. We, we are li- limited in our Lord, and so we don't even know how we should pray sometimes. But, but the Spirit of God knows the will of God, and so he intercedes for us in accordance uh, with the will of God for our lives. Well, we are too weak to know what we should pray for. Even the Apostle Paul did not always know how to pray for his knees. Listen to the scripture. And, 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 and he, he writes in 2 Corinthians 12 and 7, very fascinating words. He said, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. And so three times, three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that God's power, Christ's power, may rest on my life. And that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. I delight in in insults. I I delight in persecutions. I delight in weaknesses. For when I am weak, then I am actually strong. Now, here's the thing. Paul's request did not correspond with God's plan for his life. And so, he had gone to God and he said, Lord, I want you to take this, this thing, this, this pain, this suffering, this persecution that I'm going through, I, I want you to take it away from me. And so Paul wanted God to take it away, and, and he went before the Lord three times. In other words, he prayed intensively three times. Referring to the fact that he prayed over and over and over and over again. But Jesus said, listen Paul, I'm not going to take it away. I will give you sufficient grace to sustain you through this situation. You see, 
our insight into God's world is imperfect. And that affects the way we pray. We, we are puzzled sometimes as to how we should pray or what we should ask for. And, and that is when the Holy Spirit comes in to, to intercede on our behalf with groans that cannot be uttered in words. Wordless groans. In Paul's mind, the best thing for God to do for my situation is to take this thing away. And God said, no, Paul, this is not my will for your life. This is not my plan for your life. I've allowed you to go through this so you, you stay humble before me. Because I've given you so much revelation. And if, if, if I don't do this, you're going to be proud. And so this is meant to keep you humble. But there's one thing I can tell you, Paul. My grace will always be sufficient for you. In whatever you go through. And so the Spirit prays for us with world, wordless drones. And those drones are really divine articulations. They, they are perfect prayers that the Spirit of God offers on behalf of the children of God. They, they, they are cries uh, from the Holy Spirit uh, to God the Father. The Holy Spirit groans for us. In other words, God the Spirit cries out on behalf of God's children in the presence of God. And so he groans with, 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 with groans that cannot be expressed in words. You see, God sees what you, do, you and I do not see. The, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16 and 7, the Bible says, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so our prayers might be based on you know, the things that we are seeing outwardly or, or the things that we, we, we even feel which might not necessarily be in accordance with God's plan for our lives. And so 1 Corinthians 2 and 11 says, For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And so the Holy Spirit knows our deepest desires, and not only does he know our deepest desires, but he also knows the plans of God for our lives. And so when we are praying, Lord, this is what I want, this is what I want, and the Holy Spirit is saying, you know, child of God, this is not in accordance with God's plan for your life because the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans of, of God for you. And so I'm going to step in and I'll pray for you in accordance with God's plan for your life so that your life will be truly blessed. And so the Spirit of God prays for us in accordance with the will of God and the plan of God for our lives. He, he groans for us about our jobs. He groans for us about our businesses. Uh, he groans for us about our finances, about our health, about our children, about our marriage, about you know, bondages that need to be broken, about our ministry situations. We, we don't know the perfect will of God for our lives concerning these situations, but the Holy Spirit of God does. And so the Bible says in Romans 8 and 28, he intercedes for, intercedes for us with wordless groans. Now, the word groan could mean two things. It, it could mean, first of all, uh, unspoken words. No, no words are expressed at all. You, you're just in anguish. You know, you are before the Lord. You are not speaking any words. There's an anguish in your spirit. That's a form of groaning. And as I thought about it, I remember, you know, a few years back, I, I, was, uh, I was meditating. Now, no, I think I was, reading the, I was reading the scriptures, and I have this habit of, when I'm reading the Bible, you know, sometimes I get to you know, a scripture, and then I know, uh, you know, God wants me to pray this out. And so I, I'll just pray it. I'll just, you know, circle it in my Bible, and it's, it's a point of prayer. I'll put the date, and I'll say, write on the prayer. In other words, Lord, I'm believing for this in my life. And so I'll do that. And I remember reading the scriptures, and there was a point that particular time I wanted to pray. I couldn't pray, but I felt this anguish in my heart concerning what I wanted God to do. And I just found myself just tearing my shirt, my shirt just like that. No ways expressed. That's a form of groaning. And groaning can also be cries that are not even expressed in words. Just an audible sound within your spirit. You, you are making some sounds within you, but you, you, you're not putting any particular words 
out to the Lord. Those groanings of the Holy Spirit are perfectly in accordance with the will of God for our lives. Please listen carefully. Our inability to pray as precisely as we need to does not hinder God's ability to work everything out for our good with perfection. Because the Spirit of God prays for us with precision on our behalf. And so, the fact that you, you don't have the ability to articulate your prayer the way you should, you should articulate it before the Lord doesn't hinder God from doing what God wants to do for your life. Because you can depend upon the Holy Spirit of God to pray for you, to groom for you on, on your behalf before God. And that is why it's so important that we draw close to the Spirit of God. Can I have an amen? You see, the truth is, in the final analysis, it is God's will concerning our lives that will determine whether or not our prayers are going to be answered. And so, Romans 8.27 says, the Holy Spirit helps us. He helps us in accordance with God's will. Now, the word that is used for help occurs only in one other place in the New Testament. And we find it in Luke chapter 10 and verse 40. And this is when Mary was so overwhelmed. Remember the story of when Jesus went to visit Mary and Martha at their home. And you know, Mary was in the kitchen and busy preparing food and all that. And then you know, uh, uh, sorry, Martha was, was busy in the kitchen preparing for the Lord, and Mary was sitting at, at the feet of Jesus, and, and Mary said, Lord, please, would you tell, Martha said, Lord, would you tell Mary to, to help me? I'm overwhelmed. Here I am. You're here with the 12 disciples, and I, I'm busy trying to cook for all of you, and all she's doing is just sitting down at your feet. Would, would you tell, you know, my sister to help me? And that's how the Holy Spirit of God helps us. Mary was saying, Martha was saying, I can't do this by myself. Help me. Tell her to help me. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. He helps us in our weaknesses. When we feel so overwhelmed, and it seems as if we can't even carry the load in prayer, we can depend upon the Holy Spirit of God to help us. Isn't our God a kind God? Isn't he a good God? Isn't he worthy of our precious? That's who he is to us. He helps us. And that's why the Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 18, the Bible says, pray in the spirit on all occasions. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Groan in the spirit. Let him groan through you. Let him pray through you with groanings. If you are blessed with the gift of tongues, pray in the spirit by using your gift of tongues as well in prayer. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 and 15, he said, I will pray with my spirit, but I'll also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Church, the Holy Spirit, who is at work in us, who lives in us, is the same power that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. Let me say it again. The Spirit of God, the gift of the Father, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us, is the same Holy Spirit who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. He will empower you. He will transform you. He will develop your character. He will lead you. He will guide you. He, he will teach you and remind you of things that you need to remember. He will bring life into your situation. And he will draw you away from sin. And he will intercede for you. And that's why Jesus said to the disciples, go and wait in Jerusalem for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, we will not leave this place. Because what else is going to distinguish us from the rest of the people on the face of the earth? And that's why David said, Lord, I know I've sinned, but whatever you do, don't cast me away from your presence. And please, 
Father, don't take away your Holy Spirit from me. You see, David knew from personal experience that without the Spirit of God, there was nothing he could do. Without the Spirit of God, he couldn't have killed that lion with his bare hands. Without the Spirit of God, he couldn't have killed that bear with his bare hands. Without the Spirit of God, he certainly could not have overcome Goliath. It was the Spirit of God that enabled him to do all that. So he said, don't take your Spirit from me. And Moses knew that without the, the Spirit of God, the presence of God with them in the person of the Holy Spirit, nothing else was going to distinguish them from the rest of the people or on the face of the earth. Nothing. Only the Holy Spirit was going to do that. And Jesus knew that without the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I can do absolutely nothing. We need the power of the Spirit of God to be with us. Let me, let me just close with this. Um, sometime last week, I, I was uh, standing by, you know, in our kitchen, and, and I was just uh, looking out the window uh, in the kitchen. I think I was doing some chores, and, and I was, you know, kind of uh, looking out a little bit. And then uh, the Holy Spirit arrested my mind with, with a thought, and the interesting thing is that uh, he actually reminded me of uh, something he had said to me a few years back whilst I was standing in the same spot. And so that other thing came to my mind. And, and so I was reflecting over what uh, he was uh, putting uh, into, into my heart. And even though it's personal, I, I think that it's relevant. So, so I said, let me just share this. Now, the, the message that he gave me was to, to stay connected to him because without him, I'll make a shipwreck of my life. Without the Holy Spirit, you'll make a wreck of your life. You'll make a wreck of, of your calling. You, you'll make a wreck of your purpose. And then the interesting thing was that he used the example of that ship, Dali, that uh, crashed into the Baltimore Bridge. Anybody remembers that? And so, so the Holy Spirit of God reminded me of that. And, and then, you know, when that ship crashed into, into uh, the, 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 the bridge, it, of course, it caused so much damage. And this was a message that he dropped into my heart. The reason why that ship crashed into the bridge was because the ship lost power. And the moment it lost power, the captain was unable to control the ship. The captain could not do anything because he had lost connection to, to the source of power that enabled him to control that 800,000 ton ship. And the result was a deadly crash. You see, when we get disconnected from the Holy Spirit, we lose power that enables us to function effectively as Christians. Are you with me? Without the Holy Spirit, we become powerless. When we become powerless, we lose control. And so the message is this. Stay connected to the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Stay connected to the Holy Spirit. Sin can cause you to disconnect, to be disconnected from the Holy Spirit. Stay connected to the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Shall we rise up, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus.